Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. Well, today I want to talk to you about the idea of prayer. The idea of prayer. And how, I'm going to just tell you right now, there's a lot of things all of you can be called to do, but if you are going to be a person of Jesus, a person of God, you have got to be a person of prayer. You have got to be a person of prayer. And so today, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to unload almost everything I know about prayer, okay? And we'll get out of here around 3 o'clock. Now, I, I don't know that much, actually. Uh, it might take me about 15 minutes to unload everything I've learned. Because I'll tell you, in prayer, this is one thing that helped me. Prayer is about the time. It's really not about the technique. I have probably failed more in prayer than I've ever succeeded, but... How do you even gauge that? I mean, that's like saying, I have failed on, on, on dates with Amanda. I have. I mean, I have not taken her on nearly as many dates as she deserves. But even on those dates, I'm always thinking about money. I'm not lavish on her. Well, you know, I remember when we first got married and she moved here. And, you know, around here, there ain't a whole lot to do. So the big thing was every three weeks or so, I'd take her to Greenville to spoil her. And we'd get to Longhorn. I was going to spoil her, right? And she said, I'll take the shrimp uh, for the appetizer. And I was like, "Uh uh-uh, shrimp's a meal. No, it's on the appetizer list. Well, then I guess I'll get, do you have a ham sandwich? Because whatever she's going to get, uh, I won't be able to get anything. And so I look back now and I'm like, come on, like of, of any investment, you know? And that's what prayer is like sometimes. Sometimes we look back and we say, we say things like, I just don't have a good quiet time. I just don't do good at it. I don't, good being, I don't do good being still. I don't do good when I get along with the Lord. And I just wanna, I want to remind you, there's no wrong way to pray. There's no broken way to pray. Being alone with the Lord is the goal. And that's the win, is to be with the Lord. A.W. Tozer said this, that what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Well, how are we going to get our minds renewed if we don't ever engage Him, if we never spend time with Him? What I have found out is that, I I like this saying, I used to say all the time, uh, I wanted to have quality time. I I heard a wife say one time, she said, you give quantity time and I'll deal with the quality. Give quantity time, spend time with me. Spend time with your spouse. Spend time with those you love. Spend time with the Lord. It don't matter how quality it is. You don't have to get in there and get your Bible reading done and get, get the prayer perfect and uh, speak in tongues for 15 minutes and then make sure that you uh, prophesy for 15 minutes and then write down everything in 15 minutes. <laughs> when we get in there and we start trying to make God a, a robot, it's not very enjoyable. The best conversations I've ever had in my life is usually at the tail end of some argument or some stupid thing I've been mad at Amanda about, and we end up talking to 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. There's a sweet spot that gets to eventually when we just spend time with one another. You know, it's weird. I, I can't have those good conversations during the day. <laughs> I'm a little bit high strung, you know? That's why we say often it's good to, to open our eyes in the morning and begin to talk to God because you don't have anything else started yet. And then it's also good to end your day talking to the Lord because hopefully He can help you get all the things off your mind and you can actually sleep. I don't know about y'all, but I've been struggling sleeping lately. I've been struggling sleeping. Uh, since Coulter's accident on Wednesday, I don't, I don't think I've slept more than 45 minutes at the time. I, I just wake up in the middle of the night praying, God, touch that boy. I've been praying for Vernon uh, the last couple of days. Vernon Dozier got bit by a spider and he's really sick. Been praying for him. So many of our teachers and so many of our kids at our school are, are, have been sick. I mean, we're, we're thin. And I've been praying for them. I wake up in the middle of the night and just can't go back to sleep. I just have them on my mind. And I've caught myself here at the beginning of 2022 not grabbing my distractions, but actually going to the presence of the Lord. Usually I would open my phone and turn on an episode of something that can drown out my thoughts and what God has woke me up for, but I've caught myself taking the time to call out every single person that comes to my mind. So many sick, so many hurting, so many 
uh, fearful right now, fearful of their you know, body ailments, but also fearful of jobs. And, and it just seems to be a lot of turmoil and a lot of heartache. And I catch myself worrying about it all day, but then taking time to pray about it at night. I wish I took more time during the day to pray about it. Because my worrying ain't helping anything. It might just be taking years off my life. A.W. Tozer is a great man that, that wrote several books on prayer. But he also said, God never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. Only to know this to, to quiet our spirits and relax our nerves. That's all his job is, is to quiet our spirits and to relax our nerves. As you read the Word of God, there is a powerfully deep connection between prayer and peace. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Wouldn't that be nice? I wish, I wish just a handful of Christians that they would be known for their reasonableness. Be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious for anything. Now, it's not talking about the end times. It's talking about your God is with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He walks with you. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, you've got nothing to fear. Why? Because He is with me. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Anything. I know we want to put a caveat there. There's things to be anxious about, right? I mean, after hearing about Friday, my anxiety about spiders have gone back up. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, stop trying to understand your problem. Stop trying to figure it out. There is a peace granted you that will surpass your understanding. Because there's a lot of difficulty in our life that we are too thick-headed to understand. In fact, if God were to ever tell us why it is that we're going through what we're going through, we would probably say, oh Lord, well if you move the pawn over here, move the knight over here, I, I, this could be a lot easier. You're making this harder on me than you think. I, I think I could figure it out a little bit better. Oh, so you're trying to get from A to B. That's what you're trying to do. Well, let me, let me try to figure it out a little better. We need to trust God and let Him be God and receive the peace that He'll give us. He'll give us the grace to endure it if we will go to Him to receive it. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, whatever's excellent, anything worthy of praise, keep your mind on those things. Not the fear, not the pothole, not the trouble. Keep your mind on all the things that could possibly work out. Keep your mind in hope. Keep your mind in faith. Keep your mind in love. Keep your mind in peace. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God will be with you. Y'all, that ain't even my sermon yet. Okay, let's get to my sermon. Here we go. I want to talk to you today about your quiet time, your prime time, your prayer, your alone time. So what is prayer? Prayer is a conversation. Conversations work better when there's some talking and then some listening. But often we don't even do conversations well. We usually talk and then while we gave the other person the room to talk, we sit there and think of our response, right? We do this with God too. In fact, we're so afraid of silence with God, often we'll throw in as many words as we can. Oh God, dear Father, we love you so much, God. God, we thank you, Jesus, for, Lord, you have done so many great things. God, Father, we can't stand even a break. If you were to talk to somebody the way you pray sometimes, they would think you think they're schizophrenic. Our Heavenly Father, I just come here today to talk to you, God, and I just wanted to, uh, Jesus, and I uh, wanted to talk to you about my friend, Je God. He's not ADD. He's listening to you. 
rest. Let me also tell you, your daddy in heaven is not expecting an eloquent prayer from you. You're a child. And I want you to think about that. You're a child of the Most High God that that has been given the access to, to engage the throne of God. We're not like Esther. We don't have to be asked to come in. We can barge through the doors and go sit in the lap of daddy in the throne anytime we want. He is ready for us. And we're told in the scriptures that to, to boldly go before the throne. Our father awaits us. I don't know what it is about children, but they know exactly when you're trying to work on something, don't they? I understand now what my dad stayed in the barn all night. My job is, his job is physical labor. My job is more intellectual. And every time I try to think about anything, immediately Luke comes out with some questions. This morning I'm trying to get my mind on the message. we got some big things happening today. I'm, I'm putting everything in order. And from the back seat he goes, Hey daddy, do you know what my favorite titan is? Well now not only has he engaged me in a question, but now my ADD takes over. What titan? How does my kid know about a titan? Is he studying Greek mythology? What does he mean when he talks about, is he talking about the football titans? I mean, I'm, and he's talking about Godzilla. And he don't know how much work it is to get me back to what I was already thinking about. And by the time I get back to it, he asked me, do you know what my favorite set, you know what my second favorite titan is? I need you to be quiet right now, Luke. <laughs> I want you to know you have a father in heaven that will never say to you, I need you to be quiet. You have a, you have a father in heaven that loves you so deeply and dearly. Not only... Not only does he not expect you to be quiet, but he also doesn't, he's going to understand what you mean the first time. He's not going to ask you to clarify what you mean by Titan. He knows you better than you know yourself. He is your safe place. He's your safe place. So often we're looking for safe places among people. I want a place where I can just go and be my worst version of myself and nobody judges me. As people always say about the church, I just want to go to to a place where nobody will judge me. Well, then stop hanging around people. (laughs) If you don't want to be judged, I encourage you to hang around some animals or talk to God. God's not offended by your words, by your thoughts, by your anger, by your problems. If you slip a cuss word into a prayer, God doesn't, He doesn't care. I'm not encouraging you to do that. But I'm just telling you, God is not offended by foul language. We is. We're the ones who get offended by it. We're the ones that every time somebody says something a little off color, we're like, oh, oh, ah, okay. I think we'd be amazed at how little he is moved by us. Just just uh, uh, judging wise. Now, we're, it's clear Jesus was moved by compassion. He was moved by uh, love, by pity, or, or by um, a feeling for people. But he's moved by favor on people. But I, I don't see it very often that he ever stuck his nose up. Never once do I see his attitude that I think I'm better than or Or somebody did something. In fact, what was he most shocked by? He wasn't shocked by cuss words. He wasn't shocked by the, the, the poor folks and, and the way they acted. He wasn't shocked by the woman that came and broke an alabaster box over his feet. This single rabbi has got his skirt pulled up over his knees and she's washing his feet. I would think that would make it a little awkward. But he's not freaked out by that. What is he amazed by? He's amazed by faith. His eyes get big when somebody has extra faith. That's what gets his attention. (gasps) Don't you want the attention of the Lord? Then go boldly before the throne. Go boldly before the throne. Start a conversation with your father. And then, like, listen. And then say what's ever on your heart. The things that you think nobody will understand. He'll sit there and listen. He understands. The last thing I want you to think about is this secret place. When Jesus tells us to pray, he says to go into your secret closet. Go into the secret place and be alone with God. 
Silence and solitude are two things that we do not understand. We are scared of it. i got to be honest with you. I've gotten really convicted in the last couple of weeks about how much I rely on my phone. Every second I have to myself, I've got to pick that up to make sure there's some, some busyness. Because the thing is, when the silence comes... That's the only, t- when the silence comes, then I can hear what my body is saying. I can hear what my mind is actually saying. I can hear what my heart is actually saying. I can hear what the Lord is saying. And I don't feel like I have enough energy to deal with that right now. So I'd rather hear whatever I can, and I'll, I'll make it, I'll make it preachery. You know, when I'm real holy, I'll, I'll turn the Bible on. Do you know the Bible can be a distraction from God? I'll turn a podcast on, but it's a sermon. Because my brain needs noise. Because whenever there's silence, God can deal with me. Do you know what would be really great? If every one of you would start dealing with you. Stop expecting everybody else. Stop hoping that somebody's going to stand in the pulpit and get you straight every week. And I've got one hour out of seven days to get it straight. You're hoping I hear from on high so that you can get a word from the Lord when the Lord is available to you every single day. Every single minute. See, I don't want to schedule God anymore. I don't want to fit Him in. And that's what I'm dealing with. I'm not telling you you have to. But I've got to learn how to unplug. I've got to learn how to have some prayer time without it being drowned out by worship music. That's me. I'm not telling you what to do. But sometimes I like the worship music because it helps drown out some of those other voices. Sometimes I just need to lay raw in front of God. Listen, we believe that you can pray in the Spirit. If you've received the gift of speaking in tongues, please do not save it for Sundays. You've been given the power to speak what the Spirit is saying. Speak in tongues every day. Speak in tongues riding down the road. I catch myself. When I get that phone call that I know I didn't want to get, I catch myself. I immediately begin to speak in tongues in that moment because I don't know how to respond. I hate that feeling of supposing to be a first responder, but I've got no skills. I'm a pastor. I, my, I end 90% of my conversations with, I'll pray for you. That feels so small. I know that's not small to you, but for me, I want to be able to say, okay, I'm coming to do chest compressions. I can't. I'm, I'm very scared of medical stuff. I'm just saying, I want to do that. <laughs> I want to be able to do something. I want to be able to, if you have a problem right now, I want to bring you a check. I want to bring you a meal. I want to do something. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said that, he told Peter, he said, the devil has asked to sift you. But I prayed for you. You know, Jesus didn't see prayer as a smaller secondary thing. He saw it as the primary thing. We see over and over and over again in the Word of God that anytime he had a big decision to make, Jesus would separate himself from the crowds and go pray. He'd go up the mountain. He'd go out in the boat. He'd go in the wilderness. He found, he would go in the garden of Gethsemane. It was his place. He loved to go and pray. He loved to be in the presence of God. And that's where he gained his power. That's where he gained his power. Jesus knew who he was. He came out in the fullness of his identity when he came out of the wilderness. But so many of us are hoping other people will tell us who we are because we won't take the time to sit down with the one who designed us, who placed the desires of our heart in here and has a plan of our destiny. We won't sit down with the one who knows all that. We're hoping somebody else has got a clue. Some of us are looking at our spouses and hoping they'll validate our existence. When we got into marriage to serve the other one, we are sitting there hoping that they're going to be the ones who tell us, we're, am I doing a good job? Am I good now? Am I a good person now? Some of us are waiting for validation from parents. Your parents were meant to steward you and to lead you, but they cannot tell you who you are. God tells you who you are. And you can only find that in the secret place. All right. I'm going to try to tell you these last few things really quickly, and then I want us to pray before we get leave here today. A few books that I've read that really helped me. One was the book called 21 Seconds to Change Your World, and I had never, it unlocked something for me in my prayer life when I began to, to pray the Word of God. 
I encourage you in the morning when you read the word, find a passage of scripture so when you read it, you find something that really hits you and then go back and begin to pray it. One of my favorite exercises to do that is with Psalm 23. I love going to that and just praying it over and over again. Reminding myself that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. Meditate on the words of the Lord. Meditate on them. Memorize the scripture by constantly going back in your mind, reminding yourself, listen, God has already said this, so let it begin to go deep in your heart. Don't spend your time making up your own words. He's given you the words. Your father's written this love letter to you so that he, you can get to know him. But often we take that love letter and we're just using, we, get, we have plans to get through the love letter. We have uh, pressure to get through the love letter. We make sure we get enough chapters in of the love letter. And this is supposed to help you connect to your father. It's not supposed to make you know about him separately. God should not be reduced to principles and scripture verses. He should, when we read that we engage the word of God, we're trying to, to find God there. Amanda inherited uh, her grandmother's journals when she passed. I never got to meet her grandmother, and and Amanda's, like, number one person on earth is her grandmother. And so really the only place for me, the only way for me to know is to hear the stories. By the way, think think about that. You want to minister to somebody, don't quote scripture. Tell them your story. That's how I've met Ora May Harn, is through stories. And the other thing is I could read through those journals and see your heart written down on pages. The Word of God is that for us. We should go to, to find the Lord, not to, to gain knowledge of, of uh, intellect, but to understanding of who He is. Let them sink in your heart. So the first thing is, I, I encourage you, pray the Word. The second thing I'd encourage you is to practice the presence of the Lord. To practice the presence of the Lord. Uh, there's a book called the, uh, Practicing the Presence, pa- Practicing the Practice of the Presence uh, by Brother Lawrence. Um, and he talked about, he wanted to be a monk, and so he went and tried to become a monk, and they told him he wasn't smart enough or whatever. And so he ended up uh, working as a, uh, a cook in, in the, the monkery, in the monastery. And uh, he was working as a cook, and he said that he found that the presence of God would meet him anytime he would open himself up to him. So while he was cooking, he would just be talking to the Lord in his heart and in his mind. When something bad would happen as he cooked, he would just remark it to the Lord. Like, did you see that? He would talk about it. I remember playing a video game called uh, Mario when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, I don't play them anymore, just... (laughs) But there was was the first video game that came out that was 3D... Was, it was a Mario game, and what it was was you see Mario walking, and you can turn a camera, and at the very beginning of the game, it introduces you to your cameraman, who is a turtle and, and a cloud behind you. Could anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, three of you. Thank God. All right. This illustration always hurts somebody, but uh, anyway. For the rest of the game, you never see the turtle guy again, because you're in his view. Okay, I want you to think about that, so... So you're watching Mario, you know, he's running over here, he's jumping, ha ha, whatever. And, but you never see the turtle guy. But you don't think about the fact that you're actually seeing Mario from the turtle guy's point of view. And if you're, if you're Mario, you can turn that camera just as fast as you want, but every time you turn, you just see the back of your head. You see the back of your head. So I had this thought one day, it may not be religious, But I had this thought one day, what if I begin to understand that God is like right there. And I I can't quite ever see him. But he's always just right here watching everything I do. And what if I started living like he was that close. That I was in view of him at all times. And that everything I did was in view of God. That that I never stepped in a pulpit and realized that God was going to miss a word. So I better make sure that what I say comes from him or there'll never be a time that I can mistreat Amanda in my house that her heavenly father don't see it I better not mistreat her just because no human sees it doesn't mean the God who has power beyond anything we can imagine won't come to her defense because she's a child of his or my boys I'm their daddy nobody can tell me how to treat them 
And yet, God the Father is always right there. Not ready to judge me, but I'm going to tell you, I don't want to mistreat a single one of his kids if daddy's looking. I'll never forget driving in the mountains one time. We were on the side of a mountain. I was scared to death. I was about 16, 15, 16 years old. Daddy is in this big old excursion. We got lost in the mountains, and we were on the side of this mountain, and it was pitch black dark, and we were coming up on a, 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 a cliff, or what, not a cliff, but it was the, the road came on the edge, and I remember looking down, and I couldn't see road anymore. That's how close we were on the side of this mountain, and he had no idea where it was going. It wasn't a real road, and I would go, Daddy, what? Are you scared? And his response was a lie, but I appreciated it. <laughs> he responded with, no. No might be the most comforting words I've ever heard in my life, and I've read the Bible ten times. No. Now, we finally got to the room and got inside, and then he said, man, I was really scared. And I'm so glad he waited to then to tell me. But I want to tell you, every step of your life, every bad phone call, every bad diagnosis, what if you were to say to the Father, are you scared? And hear Him in prophetic King James language say, no. I'm with you to the end. Nothing can separate us. Nothing will separate you, not only from my view, but also from my love. Nothing can separate us. What if we were to start living every single moment of our lives as if he were that close? Because let me help you. He is. It would just do us better to live. Now, a scripture that goes with that is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, uh, rejoice in all things, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Has that ever convicted you? Pray without ceasing. That's probably why we throw so many gods and fathers in our sermons, I mean, in our prayers, because we're scared to death that we're going to cease. But what it actually probably means is that we pray constantly. Our, our minds are set on Him. There's not a moment in our life that... God isn't present. And so we should have conversation with Him. And when I've been in my best moment spiritually, everything in my life I'm having a conversation with God while I'm doing it. I even have moments where I'll say to God in my heart, I'll be like, did you hear that? God, ain't that cool? I have those prayers. Practicing the presence. Hey, the way this ends, give thanks in all circumstances, absolutely. But the way this ends is it says... Do not quench the spirit. You want to fulfill the law, you want to fulfill the will of God and Christ in your life? Then rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and give thanks in all things. But also, don't quench the spirit. When we stop doing these things, we quench the spirit in our, of, of God in our lives. Here's one more, and I, I hope this helps you. And I read a book called The Sacred Pathways. And um, I struggled for a long time because Pastor Buddy, when I first became associate pastor here, he invited me to come meet him at 6 o'clock in here every day. And it wasn't an invitation. I said it wrong. It was an expectation. 6 o'clock sharp in here in the pitch black dark. And I'd walk in here every single day on time about 6.20. And... I'd walk into this pitch black, scary sanctuary. This place ain't cool dark. I remember the prayer meetings of old. Pitch black dark in here ain't nothing but the glowing red Jesus back there. And saints praying. And saints praying don't always sound comforting. There's a lot of... And I'm so thankful to God I got to hear those prayers... I heard Roy Baysmore call out to God more than one time in this place that blessed my socks off, but it was not comforting. Six o'clock, I'd come in here with Pastor Buddy, and he would walk around, and I'd hear him. He'd pray one lap around. He'd pray in, in English. The next one, he'd pray in the Spirit. And the next one, he was crying. Oh, as he was going around this place, and I was not comfortable. 
So I'd come up and I'd play the piano. He'd let me come play the piano at worship. And that's where I found the Lord. For me, I had, I had to do something. And playing music is a way that I just found my communion with the Lord unlike any other place. For some of you, it's outdoors. Some of you are na- nature people. You find them as you walk through the woods. You walk by the river. That's not a small thing. Go where you find the Lord. Some of you, it's in your senses. You need to light a candle. Some of you need to, to drink your coffee while you're with the Lord. You need to taste something. Taste and see the Lord is good. Hallelujah. And the Lord's better when he's about half cream and half coffee. You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't think that's small. Find what, what works for you. Move it around. If you want to write these down, these are some of you, tradition is your thing. And sometimes we've gotten really negative on tradition, but what a blessing when you pull out the old hymn book and you read those words that have meant so much to you. Or maybe when you flip to the back of the hymn book, which we never do in Pentecost, but read some of those prayers back there. There are prayer books where people wrote down prayers for you to read. Sometimes that liturgy is helpful to you. If that's you, be blessed in that. Be thankful for it. Solitude. I think all of us need some solitude. All of us need a few minutes alone, unplugged. Get rid of the phone. Solitude, real solitude, actual solitude. Care. Some of you find some comfort in the Lord when you're taking care of others. A blessing of the Lord while you're taking care, while you're serving others. I, I think it's a great idea to, to write notes while in your prayer time. When the Lord brings somebody to your mind, sit down and write a thank you note to that person. Declare. Some of us find great joy and connection to the Lord when we're declaring with boldness what God has done in our life. Evangelism can be a connection in prayer. Again, because everything we do is in the presence of God. Contemplate. Some of us just need to sit still and, and meditate on one word over and over again. Just let that continuously drip into our hearts. Contemplation, thinking about God, keeping Him in our And then the last one is mind. Some of us connect to God by learning books, digging in, studying the Word of God, finding out what the key word of the verse is. Some of us do really well with that. And my encouragement to you is don't think your your kind is small and you wish you had somebody else's. God designed you the way you are. Go where you get the joy. Go where God has given you the joy. Enjoy your time with the Lord. The last thing I would say to you is uh, you know, the, some, some things that I found foundational for me that were helpful. I don't know if this will help you or not, but uh, take your Bible when you pray. Wherever you go, take your Bible with you. Pray in the Spirit. Don't ever underestimate how big of a deal that is. If you pray in the Spirit, pray what God is asking you to pray. Don't just pray what you want, pray what He wants. Journal. Write it down. I, if, I could, if I could get everybody in this room to do one thing, I beg you to start journaling. Start writing down what the Lord is telling you. Start writing down lists of the people you're praying for so that you can go back one day and see how many of those He actually took care of. I don't know about y'all, but I've written down lists over and over again, and often I'll find them, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, he did that, and I never told him thank you. A a miracle happened here, and I I, I just went right past it. I totally forgot. I I forgot that I went through that. So many times he comes to our rescue, and we don't even give him credit. Write it down so you can remind yourself. Write down words from the Lord. When God gives you something, write it down. Uh, write down your dreams. Listen, Joseph learned a lesson that we all should learn. Not everybody ought to hear your dreams. Because your dreams, people cannot be trusted with your dreams. But God can. Because, as we learn in Proverbs, the desires of your heart were placed there by God. So dream, dream big. The fourth one is solitude and unplug, and I encourage you to find a place and time. Find, our, and I know we're all busy, but find a place and time. Hey, spouses, this is a great thing. Say Pastor Webb told you to do it, and so you tell your husband the hour you get home. Ladies, the hour you get home, husband, 
That's my hour with the Lord. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. All right. Please don't do that. That was a joke, all right? Don't ever use me to hurt your marriage, please. Okay. Mountains. Jesus would go to the mountain. He'd go to the boat. He'd go be alone with the Lord. He was always looking for this private time with God. He spent hours and hours and hours. And then the disciples said, teach us how to pray. So in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5, he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, your secret place, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Don't you want to see miracles take place? Then go whisper in the secret what you want from the Lord and then watch it come to pass. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. But when you pray. Now remember, Jesus spent hours praying I want you to think about that. He'd spend, he spent days. There was one time he spent eight days in our prayer retreat. And this is how he said we ought to pray. This short 21-second prayer. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Most of us who learned that, we also had the tag on the end, for yours is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I believe that the Lord was giving us a template prayer, so when the devil whispers to us, you don't have a prayer, we could say, oh, Jesus gave me one. But the template there, you could pray it for eight days. He opens up with praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He moves from praise into perspective. Not my will. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we can petition. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our daily bread sometimes might look like bread, but as Americans, not often. Often our daily bread looks like, God, I pray that you'll heal culture today, that you'll move him forward today. Our daily bread sometimes can be, Lord, I've been real angry for weeks. Lord, help me to love my family better. That's what I need today. That's the grace I need today. Lord, I don't want to go to work today. But give me the strength and give me the love to go to work. Sometimes it's the opposite, isn't it? We really want to go to work. We don't want to go back home. Lord, give me the grace to deal with these kids just one more day. I don't know what you have to do tomorrow, but today, God, if you don't intervene, one of them ain't going to make it. Well, they'll make it to you. And when we rely on Jesus like that, when we petition him for these things, do you know he, he wants to offer those to you? Now let me just tell you something. I, I, want, you to, I want you to know something real, real deep about something. I, I don't think it's possible. I do not think it's possible to stay married to one person your whole life without the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think it's possible. Amanda is the best woman I have ever met in my life, and I have to daily ask, Lord, help me to love her the way I want to, but I don't. Help me to feel for her what I ought to feel. Help me to, to, be, to cherish again what I promised her I would cherish. But in myself, I can't do it. And often the Lord gives me that grace. Often. Things I've become frustrated with. The grace is poured out over and all of a sudden salvation comes again. 
salve comes again. Now, I, I can tell you, I've been a lot less perfect than she has. But what I have gotten increased has totally been through the Holy Spirit. I pray the same over this church. This is an incredible church. My prayers often when I think of you is, God, please don't let me mess it up. Wonderful people in this place. You hired a 35-year-old to take over a 91-year-old church. And it blesses me so much when some of you say that I'm wise beyond my years, but I want you to understand not a single one of those things can be to my credit. The journey, the path that God has put me on my whole life, the people He's brought me into, the difficulties I've been dragged through, the grace that I have been given, the mentors I've been blessed by, all of that was designed by God Almighty. And my time with Him is the reason I'm as close as I am. Now, I'm not blaming Him for the shortcomings. I know there's plenty of those. But I wouldn't be where I am without Him. Make your petitions known to the Lord. And then we can move into protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Every one of us in this room has evil crouching at the door. Sin is trying to get you. Satan is trying to get you. But Jesus said, I've prayed for you. I want you to know, church, prayer is the only way you're going to endure. God never tempts, but he can shut down the tempter. He can close the mouth of the lions. He can stand in the midst of the fire with you. Lord, lead me away from fire, but if I'm in fire, don't let the evil one get me. Jude opens up with this beautiful thing. Jude, the, the book of Jude says that he, he loved us, he saved us, and he called us. And then he ends that book, that short book with, to him who is able to keep us from falling. Oh, what a prayer. I'll never forget Naomi Denton sitting, sitting right there where Miss Sandra is. We had prayer requests. Naomi Denton stood. Naomi Denton, y'all, stood up. If there's ever been a saint on earth, it's her in my mind. She stood up and said, I need you to pray that I'll make it to the end. And I thought, if she's got to pray that, I ain't got a chance. And what she was doing was saying, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. And we need to pray it every day, for, we, for sin is crouching at the door. And then we end with praise. But yours is the kingdom, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.